Yes, I'm going to present my work on studying generalization in deep learning, and this is joint work with Dan Roy. Uh, so what is generalization? Generalization is the relationship between the performance on the training data versus performance on some future and seen data. Uh, and our goal is to improve our understanding of generalization of neural networks in the deep learning regime. Uh, so that can help us to understand or explain when and why the existing learning algorithms work and when they work well. And also it can help us design improved algorithms with some provable generalization guarantees. So for example, we might be interested in algorithms uh, that work well when we don't have too much data. Or maybe we have a lot of data, but uh, we want an algorithm to work well when the signal is weak. So there is a lot of underlying uncertainty in the data. So kind of a classical um, textbook generalization story can be captured by this plot. Uh, so as we allow more and more complex model, um, the training error decreases. And the theory predicts that the test year, which is here marked in green, decreases initially, but then starts going up as we start overfitting. And this gap between the green and blue lines, so the true and the uh, train error, is called the generalization error. Um, so Nisha Bertal, just three years ago, the experimental showed that that's not what happens in neural networks. So they ran some experiments. We trained a network on MNIST dataset using stochastic gradient descent. And they showed that as you increase the size of the hidden layer, your training gear goes down, which is this um, black line, and approaches zero. And your test gear also keeps going down. Even when you got zero error, your test gear still keeps going down. So we don't see that overfitting as we did in the previous story. Uh, so there are a lot of researchers working on explaining this phenomena, and it is considered to be still an open problem to explain this plot. So we'll approach explaining deep learning with statistical learning theory. So let me just explain the setup. So we have some training data S, which is just ID pairs um, of data sampled from some unknown data distribution D. Uh, so each pair is X, I, Y, I, and the data is the input and the output. So for example, X, I's are the input images, uh, and Y, I's are the labels. I will denote a classifier by letter H. So it maps an input X to a prediction H of X. So for example, H is a neural network mapping the, the image to the predicted label. And uh, we'll consider a zero one law. So it takes as inputs the predicted value H of X and uh, the true label Y and returns zero if we are correct and one if we are incorrect. We'll care about the following notions of risk. So we'll care about the true risk, which is just the expected loss where the expectations under the data distribution. Uh, we'll care about the empirical risk, which is just the average loss over our training data. And we'll care about the generalization error, which is the gap between the two risks. So between the tr true risk, LD, minus the empirical risk, LS. So we're, we'll run a GD on some training data S, and we'll obtain a classifier H hat. And we're going to approve a bound of the following form. So the bound will be valid for any data distribution D. And it will show that with high probability over the training data, the generalization error, which is LD minus LS, is bounded above by some epsilon, which is our generalization bound. Now, the interesting part is actually what epsilon depends on. So it can depend on the hypothesis class H, on the number of training data you have, M, on the probability of failure of the bound, which is delta, on the underlying data distribution, which is D, and usually unknown. It can depend on the training sample S, on the algorithm used, which in our case is stochastic gradient descent, uh, or the actual classifier we obtained, H hat. And of course, um, what epsilon depends on can reveal a lot, like kind of guide us what kind of properties are important and uh, give give us this good generalization performance from the algorithm. So we want epsilon to depend on as few terms as possible. So for example, a classical bounds, generalization bounds in statistical learning theory are VC dimension bounds, VC bounds, that are proportional to the ratio of VC dimension on the hypothesis class divided by the number of training points M. So VC dimension of neural network class is kind of roughly a lower bound by the number of parameters. So let's consider a very small neural network and train it on MNIST data set. So it has 784 dimensional input. That's our MNIST image. And let's say we, we have a one hidden layer neural network with 600 units. So this already gives us around 470,000 um, parameters just in that one single weight matrix, which is a lot more than the number of training points. So actually this VC dimension bound is a lot larger than one. 
Now note that we're upper bounding the quantity which is between zero and one, right? Because we know that our loss is between zero and one. So LD minus LS is a quantity between zero and one. And we got a bound that's above one. So what can it actually tell us about realization? So when I started, so we'll call such bands vacuous that are above one, that are upper bounding the quantity which is between zero and one and give us a bound above one. And what I was surprised when I working when I started working in this field was that a lot of existing generalization bounds are vacuous, at least for the amount of data we have and the size of net networks we use. So we are usually in this blue regime. So we get for the amount of data we have, size of networks we use, we, we get a bound that's above one. And researchers usually care about the rate of convergence. So they want their generalization bound epsilon to converge as, let's say, one over square root of m, which is kind of what this, this plot illustrates. So one might argue that you know, as we get more data, eventually our bound gets below one, right? We get to the right of this critical point. But this is not what happens in practice. So in practice, we have neural networks. Um, we, we have, if, if we get more data, we get a larger neural network. We usually train a larger neural network, right? We don't stick to the same neural network size. So we'll always end up being in this blue regime. We'll always, our data sets will always be kind of smaller compared to the networks. Um, so we don't, have, we don't have good theory for deep learning, or good learning theory for deep learning. And 10, 15 years ago, Langford um, kind of had a similar observation for SVMs and boosting, but the community kind of mostly ignored it. So one might think, what, what, how do people, how have people been explaining generalization in practice? So usually you see plots like this. So you have the generalization year decreasing the as the training goes on, and you have your, you plot your bound, which is also decreasing and tracking the generalization year. However, the bound is usually has been rescaled, so it undergoes some kind of fine transformation just to fit on the same scale as your generalization year. So the fact that uh, VC dimension cannot explain generalization neural networks has been recognized actually a long time ago. And 20 years ago, Peter Bartley had a paper where he uses right micro complexity uh, to get new bounds, new generalization bounds for neural networks. So he shows that the generalization, bound, the generalization error can be bounded by the size of the weights in terms of the L2 norm of the weights. Now, these bounds have been modernized recently. So a few years ago, Nation Bertal had a paper where they kind of optimized these bounds for the current networks used in practice. And they replaced the L2 norm of something that's very specific for Rayleigh networks, um, something called L1 path norm. So their bound gets worse with a path norm, the larger the path norm, and gets better with a large margin. So the margin of the classifier is kind of roughly the confidence in your predictions and classifiers predictions. So we want small path norm and large margin. So let's see these bounds actually explain generalization. So we tracked, we train a small network, MNIST network with one hidden layer on actually on MNIST binar on binarized MNIST data set. And we track the path norm during training. So the path norm is growing. But this of course might not be a problem if our margin is growing. And indeed margin does grow. So we measured here the margin and this plot shows that. Um, however, notice that the path norm is plotted on the log scale, so it grows a lot faster than margin. And if you go ahead and compute these bounds, so the green is the generalization bound, you very quickly end up with a bound that's larger than one again, which is kept here. Now we tried to heavily regularize the path norm to see if that helps. So here this, uh, on the right, the middle plot shows that it, now the path norm when regularized doesn't explode anymore, so kind of stays constant during training. However, that causes the margin to be a lot smaller too. And now we see that we did obtain a bound that's below one, though it's still above 50%, which is the guessing rate for MNIST, for binarized MNIST. And of course, now the problem is that our classifier is doing really poorly too. So we get 30% train and test gear, right? So this is kind of a very poor classifier for MNIST. So again, these bounds don't really explain what's going on. So the approaches to explaining why should he Leads to generalization can be broken up in, down in two parts. So we want to show that HGD is X and X ex explains generalization. So we've seen um, work in the, in the literature saying that HGD is, for example, empirical risk minimization when the network is over parameterized, or HGD is implicit regularized loss minimization, HGD is approximate Bayesian inference, and so on. However, none of the statements that HGD is X actually explain generalization in deep learning unless we know that X implies generalization under real-world conditions. 
So in our work, we'll focus on the second part, X implies generalization, so which uses statistical learning theory. So we've seen what I've just talked about. We've seen that VC bounds don't apply generalization. Existing margin plus norm bound or try to micro complexity bounds don't apply generalization. That's um, nature risk at all work. And in our work, using pack based bounds, we show that the flatness and location are the minimum found by GD on MNIST suffices to imply generalization for stochastic networks, which I'll define in a bit. So our contribution is that using MNIST data set, we, we get non vacuous generalization bounds via pack base. Unlike traditional bounds, our bounds require a lot of computation and optimization, so they're not as straightforward to evaluate. And this work is closely rela related to work by Langford and Karana in 2002. So they computed non vacuous bounds for very small neural networks that had only three hidden layers. And their techniques actually don't extend to modern neural networks because modern neural networks, kind of the defining property is that they are really over-parameterized. So those under-parameterized networks are nothing like the modern over-parameterized networks. So the starting point of this work was the empirical observation, empirical evidence that SGD tends to find solutions where empirical risk surface is flat. And there has been some recent work on that. So here's, here are two pictures of the empirical risk surface. On the left-hand side, we see a visualization of a flat minima. So if we had some weights W parameters W lying in the flat minima, if we perturb them a little bit, will not incur too much additional empirical risk. Versus on the right-hand side, if we're in a sharp minima, and if we perturb our weights W a little bit, we'll incur a lot of additional training risk, training error. So flat minima, has been studied a while ago, actually. So it was first studied by Hochreiter and schmidt Weber in 97. And they proposed algorithms to explicitly seek out flat minima for agorization purposes. So informally, we think of flat minima as weights W, where the training error is insensitive to large perturbations. So now we'll formalize it a little bit. So again, here is a picture of the empirical risk. On the x-axis, we see the parameters. So that kind of defines our hypothesis class. So for example, weights of the neural network. Now, we, we have some weights W here that lie in some kind of minima, and we'll formalize the perturbation by putting a distribution around W. So this will be our perturbation, or measure, we'll measure the insensitivity of the classifier W. So we'll call such classifiers randomized. So a randomized classifier is a distribution Q on the parameter space of H, and its risk is just the expected risk under Q. And we'll see that our classifier W is insensitive to large perturbations if the risk of W is approximately equal to the risk of Q. Okay, so we don't incur too much additional risk, as I said. Now, here is a different minima, and kind of a lot sharper minima, right? And we can place another distribution Q prime. Now, you can see that you can perturb W prime a lot less to the bot incurred too much additional risk, right? So this classifier, randomized classifier Q prime, is a lot more sensitive to perturbations. So we'll measure how large the perturbation is relative to some fixed measure, fixed distribution P. So we fix a prior distribution P, and our perturbation Q is small relative to P if the KL divergence between Q and P divided by M is small, so it's a lot less than one. Okay. So this, the, this will measure the kind of insensitivity to large perturbations. So the pack based theorem was first introduced by McAllister in 1999, 1999. And here's the form of it. So for, it says, what it says is that for all data distributions, no matter, there are no assumptions, uh, for any prior randomized class of AP, so the prior can be anything, it doesn't have to express your beliefs or anything, we have high probability over our trained data for any posterior randomized classifier Q, so we'll call this a posterior, but it doesn't have to be a Bayesian posterior. We don't have to obtain it by a base rule. The generalization error of the randomized classifier Q is bounded approximately by KL divergence between your posterior Q, prior P divided by M. So this version of, of Cotoni bound is a little easier to interpret. So it, it, it's the same theorem, but um, here we replace these differences by something something easier. So it just says again that um, for all data distributions and for all prior distributions, we have high probability we get that our test error, which is LD, is bounded above by two times empirical error plus the KL divergence between Q and P posterior and the prior divided by M and some extra terms. 
So we'll be using this bot for optimization purposes because it's a lot easier to optimize too. So let me give you the details of the algorithm. So we, we start by minimizing the pack based bond with respect to our posterior parameters Q. Now we can get rid of all the terms that don't depend on Q. We also will want to use optimization to minimize this. So we need to replace our 0, 1 loss by some differential bill surrogate. So this is our new bound. And we optimize over the parameters of the posterior, right? So in our case, as I said, the posterior can be anything. So in our case, we'll choose it to be a Gaussian centered to W with diagonal covariance matrix, where the diagonal entries are S's. So here is our new objective. We want to minimize the empirical error plus the cable divergence between posterior and the prior. We'll choose the prior to be also Gaussian centered at random initializ initialization W0 with diagonal covariance mat matrix. So it will be an isotropic Gaussian. So the covariance is just lambda times identity. And we will learn lambda via union bound. So pack based theorem requires you to set the prior P before seeing the data. But you can account, you can still learn uh, that lambda from the data and account for it via union bound. So now our objective will have here an extra penalty term due to this union bound, due to learning the due, due to learning lambda from the data. So here's our final objective. Empirical risk plus the KL divergence between two Gaussians. Now we can compute the KL divergence between two Gaussians analytically. So it's just the L2 distance between your weights W and your random initialization W0, plus some penalties depending that are, that are due to the variances. So this function psi looks like this. So it's if you're, so here's just S over lambda. So you, if S posterior variance is a lot larger than your prior variance, you'll incur a lot of additional penalty. If you're a bit larger, the penalty will be a bit worse, so it's better to be actually sorry smaller. It's better to be smaller than your posterior than your prior variance than it's than to be larger. And if you're kind of close by, the penalty is almost nothing, right? So here are our results. So we we trained one and two and three hidden layer neural networks on MNIST data set by Norris MNIST. So the training error in all three cases was around zero percent. The test error was between one and two percent. Now the stochastic classifier error, so that perturbed error under the Gaussian, is a little bigger than the training error, so it's around 3%. So the perturbation incurs a little bit of additional, additional error. The test error is kind of the same, just about 3% of stochastic classifier. And the pack base bounds this stochastic classifier test error by 16 to 20%. So of course it's fairly loose. But you know, we have shown that we can actually map the shape and location of the minima found by GD to non vacuum generalization bounds. Now, the bounds are too loose to actually distinguish between state-of-the-art algorithms and non-state-of-the-art algorithms, right? Because we usually have just a few percentage difference. So the question is just how tight of a generalization band can we establish? And there is a lot of space improvement, actually. So we know from pack based sphere what the optimal posterior Q star is. It is just it's proportional to the Gibbs distribution or some call Gibbs posterior, so it's proportional to exponentiated loss, exponentially to exponentiated and rescaled loss, and it's absolutely continuous with the prior density. Now, in our case, we chose Q to be a Gaussian distribution, so you can kind of think about this as a variational approximation to the Gibbs posterior. We also, so just again, one more thing. So you, even with the Gaussian, you could remodel the posterior with a diagonal covariance matrix, but you can actually model all diagonal entries and capture some of the correlations in the parameters, which could also improve the band. Now also from pi B's theorem, you know, theory, you know that what the optimal prior P star is. So if you fix a learning algorithm S, a learning algorithm that maps training data S to Q of S, a randomized classifier, you know that the optimal prior P star is just the expected expectation of QFS under the training data. And you know that at this P star, the expected KL divergence between your posterior and the prior, and this optimal prior, is just the mutual information between the training data and your weights W. Now, as I mentioned before, you have to choose the prior P before you see the data. It has to be independent of the data. However, it is allowed to be dependent on the unknown data distribution. But of course, it's very hard to take advantage of this, right? Because we don't know the data distribution. So our idea was that we can learn the prior 
using the data S, but in a very stable way to change this in S. So it will be kind of weakly dependent on the training data. And we use something called differential privacy. So differential privacy is a very strong notion of stability. So what we show is that if you learn the prior P from the data, but using a, an epsilon differentially private algorithm, then you have a valid pack base bound. So this is just the same pack base bound, but now it has an extra penalty. So this penalty depends on the differential privacy level of your algorithm that learned the prior. So an ideal way to compute um, an epsilon differentially private prior is some, by something called exponential mechanism. So using those Gibbs distribution, but it's very expensive and not possible to do in practice. So what we use is we use SGLD, so stochastic gradient launch event dynamics, which is just like doing SGD, but you add a little bit of Gaussian noise at each gradient step. And uh, it's been shown that HLD converges weakly to a stationary distribution, which is a Gibbs distribution. So again, just being uh, close, just converging weakly to something that's differentially private doesn't you know, immediately give you the bound, right? So but we also show that V convergence suffices to yield the same generalization guarantees as the me me exponential mechanism itself. So the V convergence suffices. Of course, again, we cannot test whether SGLD converged actually or not, but in our work, we kind of ignore this and um, we run SGLD for a very long time to kind of, you know, assume that it converged. Um, so we used this, these differentially private priors to optimize an algorithm called entropy HGD. So this algorithm was specifically designed to have better generalization than stochastic gradient descent. Uh, what it does, so I, I didn't write down the objective here, but uh, what it does, it kind of um, exponentiates, and so it optimizes something called local entropy, which is the integrated exponentiated loss, kind of roughly. So you smooth out the, your surface a little bit, which should help optimization and kind of help to get to, let's say, flatter minima. And it claimed to have better generalization performance than stochastic gradient descent. So uh, let's start with the with the bottom plot here, actually. So original entropy HGD algorithm, so there's a parameter called thermal noise. And as you vary the thermal noise, it also controls the refitting. So if the thermal noise is uh, really low, then you actually fit the true labels really, really fast. That's normal stochastic gradient descent. And, oh, and this is, sorry, I forgot to mention, actually, this is random labels. So we randomize the labels in MNIST data set to see how much kind of overfitting our algorithm does. So now you can control that thermal noise parameter and control the overfitting. So for very high values of thermal noise, we actually don't see any overfitting. So it stays at the guessing rate of 50%. However, as you um, decrease thermal noise, you get a lot more with overfitting. So actually, so as you did just was line here. So entropy HGD overfits even a lot faster and a lot worse than stochastic gradient itself. It's uh, stochastic gradient descent itself. So the kind of the, the statement that, you know, entropy HGD has better generalization performance on its own, it's not really true, right? So what we've done is we, during our analysis, we realized that entropy HGD optimizes the prior distribution of the pack base bound. Now, as I said, this is invalid, right? Because we cannot optimize based on the data, the prior. However, we modified the algorithm a little bit to get a differentially private algorithm and then get a valid pack base bound with the theorem that I've just shown you. So what we show is that on random labels, so on the right-hand side here is, again, that's our modified version of the algorithm, where the, it's modified to be epsilon differentially private. We see that there is no overfitting anymore on the random labels. And these are the bounds, actually. It's kind of hard to see. Um, yeah, so the true training gear is around guessing, guessing rate, the true training test, and these are the pack base bound and some other differential privacy bounds. So they're quite a bit tighter, but also again, whereas our previous work on optimizing the bound did not, the, the bounds were valid under no assumptions. In this work, we assume that stochastic gradient launch event dynamics actually converge to stationary distribution. And these are the results in true labels, so a convolutional and a fully connected network. Um, so again, the true and test here are around 2%, and the pack base bound gives us a bound kind of around 3%, so these bounds are a lot tighter using the differentially parameter prior. Uh, 
And there has been some follow-up work by other people. So Joe et al. very recently had a paper where they combined compression bounds with our flat minimum approach. And they get some state of some uh, they get some bonds that are state of the art on some larger data sets like ImageNet. And Aurora et al. also had a very recent paper using compression again and minimum description length back based combination. So in summary, we need non vacuous bounds to connect impl implicit regularization to measured generalization error, right? If our bound is above one, it doesn't really tell us that much. In our work, we exploit cheap and location of the minima fund by stochastic gradient descent using pack base. So pack base allows us to relate flight minima to generalization. And these, these bonds can be tightened quite a bit and will require computation, math, and creativity. That's it.